Hey everyone and welcome back. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. And today we are here with... Sham Fisher, owner welcome. of Zion Cliff Lodge. Yes, welcome, welcome. We're happy to have you here. Uh, he also uh, was raised and grew up in the FLDS community, the polygamous group that Warren Jeffs ran for quite some time before he was put in prison. And so we're going to be talking a little bit more about kind of how that experience was for him and I. Yeah, so I guess the first question is, who is the prophet when you were younger and like what was your experience like growing up? Being yes, uh, Melissa, so uh, I was actually born in Salt Lake City in Sandy area and uh, very young when I first moved to the uh, Hill Dog, Colorado City, about six months old. Uh, or that's when my family uh, came down and uh, lived here uh, permanently full time. And at that time, Leroy S. Johnson was the prophet, yeah. and Fred M. Jessup was the bishop. And it was a very different community uh, back in uh, that era. And growing up, uh, most of my childhood years was growing up with a sense of not just community, community was family, it was like one big family. And uh, everyone uh, kind of had each other's uh, best interests at heart. We uh, learned a lot of great work ethics, um, and. Uh, we had a lot of great times w and, and working together to try to make a, a livelihood. Uh, we worked uh, on outside jobs, uh, out, we did a lot of traveling. My dad did cabins on Mount Hollywood, Cedar Mountain, uh, before he got into the cabinet shop. And uh, our family started a cabinet shop called Forestwood Cabinetry. Uh, I remember that. That uh, yeah. became <laughs> one of the, the main staples of the community, yeah. employers. And, uh, and I used to remember as a kid growing up in this community, uh, 10 years old, sweeping the floor in the shop and, yeah. and doing our part and uh, doing the chores and uh, milking cows every day and, yep. and working out in the dairy and doing whatever needed to be done in the community. Uh, we became very adapt and very uh, handy at uh, doing whatever had to be done. Trades, construction, um, something growing up in this community. You learned how to uh, build a home from raw ground uh, clear up to turnkey walk-in living, we all did. the trades. We all did a little bit of everything, didn't we? We did. I grew, I grew up the same way, did a lot of different types of construction, just helping the community and helping my brothers yeah. and that. So it was very, it was a great place to learn how to work hard, I feel yes. like. So. Yeah, and a very safe place to grow up. Yeah. Um, you know, we, at that time it was, uh, we, it was a lot more isolated and, and uh, probably wasn't as noticed or traveled as it is today. Um, you know, you could hike up barefoot up any of the canyons and spend, you know, days up there as kids and not see a single soul. Yep. <laughs> uh, and we did that all the time. That was our backyard. Yep. You know, we'd, we'd climb these mountains <laughs> and these mountains, that's where we spent our afternoons. So I was going to ask about, so how big was the community at that time? So I would say that it was probably around maybe three, four thousand people okay, at so that very time. Small. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it didn't get a whole lot bigger than that, did it? Uh, at its peak, we're, it peaked out around 10,000, roughly, before okay, so it started got, to decline and blow. 10,000? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, so, was, I was low on my guess. <laughs> 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 but uh, the experience growing up, um, it was, it was uh, a very uh, safe and fun, loving environment uh, that I experienced growing up here. Right. Uh, my dad had uh, three wives and uh, 36 siblings. Um, and. You know, we, we all got along. Uh, everything wasn't perfect as in any family of that size, but, you know, we weren't learned how to respect each other and, uh, and get along and coexist and, yeah. and, and have tolerance for differences of opinions. And uh, in some sense, the religion even at that point uh, didn't really micromanage us to the level that it did later on. Right. Uh, and we felt like we had a lot more freedoms and, and you know, we were still taught to be, you know, good people, speak the truth, integrity, you know, your word is your bond. Um, uh, we were told, you know, to be self-sufficient. I remember our family uh, canning peaches into the night, cherries, apricots, and we, yep. we worked diligently on a seven-year food supply in the root cellar, yeah. you know, uh, uh, yep. per, per the, the, the religion uh, requirements uh, and asking us to, you know, just be prepared. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it you know we there wasn't we weren't told to go get on WIC or welfare or or run up credit cards and all that stuff. We were told to live within your means, be prepared. Uh, you know, don't don't uh, count on the government to, to live on. Uh, be self sufficient, be productive, be industrious, and all those things were really hardwired. I know in my family, mm -hmm. growing up, uh, that was really beat into us. Uh, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. And I think a lot of families were that way back in the time that Roy, 
Johnson was the yes. was the prophet here. Yes. I actually was born when I was born. He I, he wasn't alive anymore. So I was okay. born into ruling Jeffs being the prophet. Yeah. And I, I heard at that point things were already starting to get different. Yes. Starting to change a little bit. Uh, you know, of course, when Warren Jeffs became prophet, that's when everything <laughs> yes. changed. Yeah, but, yeah. but even for me, you know, it was it was very similar. Yeah. Uh, I hardworking. Uh, we all yeah. got along. Had a great loving family and. Uh, uh, you know, speaking for myself, I know a lot of people had some bad experiences, but but back in those days, it wasn't anything like it, like it like became. What it, yeah, it became, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, as the years went on, uh, I remember when the Roy S. Johnson uh, passed on and when Roland Jeffs um, uh, became the prophet and the leader. Um, for the first probably six, seven, maybe even a year, um, I personally didn't see a lot of change. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the Jeffs at that point were operating from Salt Lake City, right. and so they weren't boots on the ground, so to speak, uh, and didn't have as much influence. But as time progressed, uh, uh, you know, they, they started getting more involved in the community, and eventually, you know, they, they moved down uh, from Salt Lake City and, and took up residence here right in Hildal Carrao City. And that's when things really started to kind of evolve and change in right. this community. Uh, not only from a religious standpoint, but from uh, just a community, a, a, a sense of community and, and, and all the uh, activities, day-to-day -day operations and the business uh, practices that didn't start changing a lot. Hmm. Uh, even under uh, Roland Jeff's uh, 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 time as prophet of right. this community. Um, uh, marriages were still going on, uh, you know, but a lot of that still kind of went on until uh, eventually Roland passed away and Warren uh, really came in. But Warren really started having dramatic effects on it a number of years before Roland Jeffs actually passed it away. It seemed like he was, in a way, already taking he charge was. in a lot of ways. He was. Was it, was it, do you know if it was Warren Jeffs' idea or his, or his father's idea to bring everyone? Because I think it was just before the 2001 Olympics, mm -hmm. they, they told everyone they had to move out of Salt Lake City yep. and, and come down to live here. That's Correct. what I was going to ask if they brought, did they bring all the members down they with did. them or was it just them? So everybody them, had yeah. to come here. Yes. Yeah. Were there any other groups in any other places at that point or was it all Canada. Salt Lake and... Yeah. Canada, so Salt Lake and here uh, okay. was kind of the three, three main, hubs. Main places, yep. yeah. Yeah, so I know that I mean, they required everyone to come down at that time. There were some families that said, you know what, I'm not moving. So they just stayed up there and in a way left the church. Yes. Because they didn't want to move. Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyone that still wanted to follow them, they had to move down. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it, wasn't an, it wasn't an option. It wasn't a suggestion. Right. It was a directive. Yeah. So, um, and, and at that point, then that's when things really started changing in this community. And I, I witnessed that and I, I lived it. Uh, and I saw it uh, e you know, evolving into morphing into this thing that uh, was not what I was taught and how what I experienced growing up. Right. Uh, you know, if, if we started, the, the restrictions started with restrictions on what colors you could wear, what color vehicle you could drive. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's, your, that's not only your, your tithing, but also your time now is expected. A lot of your personal time was supposed to be uh, donated yep. and, and given to the church. And, you know, the Fisher family is a very proud, hardworking family. Mm -hmm. And I can remember uh, in our great big home uh, that my, I grew up with my dad with 36 siblings living in studs in a big unfinished addition in the winter where you'd wake up and there'd be ice on your glass of water by your nightstand and you know blankets on the wall for, for privacy and extension cords through the studs for, for power. Uh, but then you, you would meet with the prophet and I remember dad sliding a check for a million dollars across the table to our prophet so he continued to fly on the Learjet from Salt Lake to here uh, on doing his appointments and, and living in their big finished places uh, and the, yep. the equality changed a lot mm -hmm. uh, from the Leroy S. Johnson phase to the Jess phase. Right. Uh, and the pe more and more is being expected and demanded of the people and they were living a much more lavish lifestyle than, right. than what we saw with the Royal As Johnson. you can see with yes. the big homes down yes. here and their yeah. the compound and, and all of that. Yeah. We donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to the cabinetry work and all their big homes and, 
and all their projects uh, while we were living on, on meager means and, and in unfinished homes ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know this, you weren't the only ones. A lot yeah. of the families donated not only time, but a lot of money, a lot yeah. of money to help build these places and, and do all that for them. So. And for those people who are watching who've never heard of like the concept of a tithing, what did that look like? And what yeah. was kind of the difference? I know you're saying time's a huge one, yeah. but was it like a, a strict percentage yeah. or was it like just whenever Warren would ask for it? Yeah, so it started out <laughs> as, a, as a 10% of your money before taxes. Uh -huh. Before taxes, okay. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, was considered a tithe, an appropriate tithe. Mm -hmm. And then that changed to not only 10% of your monies, but of your time. And then on top of that, then it went from that to not only did we require those two things, but now we, we need another $1,000 from your you a month to help with legal fees or with this, yep. that, or the other, or with taxes so or there were monthly fees, there in, were monthly fees in addition to those other things and there are some families that literally couldn't even afford groceries for their own table after net go and borrow and run up credit card debt mm. just to try to meet those that that requirements like having a mortgage put on it you can't afford right do you think that that was um part of like we had heard and seen a lot of stories about WIC and being able to get um or not WIC, food stamps. Well, yeah, food stamps welfare. and welfare. So Do you that's think that was part of the reason why people were started. turning to that? Was because they were out of, out of necessity. Some yeah. of it was out of necessity, but they were also directed by, get by the Jeffs yep. to go get on these subsidies. And what they call it is, they call it, well, go get what you can from the government. They call it bleeding the beast. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. Well, they did. And, 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 and they, they referred to the government in a negative way as the beast. And this is your way of bleeding the bees. Yep. Get on okay. stamp food stamps, and then it even got to the point where they were cashing out their food stamps and giving them proceeds to the Jeffs. Oh goodness! So and that was the the, the big last uh, breakup that was with Lyle Jeffs, and why he went to jail was thirteen million dollars in welfare fraud. Yep, yep. I heard about that. <laughs> oh my well, goodness! It, yeah, it, that stuff. I mean, I remember sh <laughs> there were so many times where. Or they would just, even in, in like the formal meetings in yeah. church, they would stand up and say, hey, we need everyone, every man over a certain age to donate an extra $2,000 because we have yeah. such and such thing happening right now that we need help with. So yes. that yeah. kind of stuff would just come up randomly All the too. Time. And it was, you just, yeah, you, had to be, you yeah. kind of had to have your own savings account for in case the church needed the money. Yeah, and if you didn't have the money, you were told to go borrow. Go borrow. <laughs> Goodness. And this is where it got really squirrely for a lot of people, is, and they lost really their own businesses. They built their own businesses, and, and they put themselves in a way overextended themselves, mm -hmm. uh, per the directive of the church. Right. Uh, which was sad because we had a lot of very successful businesses that were hardworking people, uh, but you know they also needed to have some resource and stuff to maintain that. Mm -hmm. And they they ran them so many requirements on, they ran them right into the ground. Yeah. Unfortunately. And right. so we see growing up, uh, that was some of the dramatic changes in, in how people were expected and what was required of them. Then the equality disparity was, uh, grew wider and wider between the congregation and the leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then it, uh, it even evolved in uglier ways where families started to get split up. Uh, and we saw you know, musical chairs with wives and kids. Uh, just big scramble going on between families moving around and some of these families and kids being rearranged and reassigned to different dads and stuff, you know, multiple times, yep. uh, which so is, is sad, horrible yeah. for a family and uh, for the psychology of the kids and adults, you know. Was just, that was that type of thing going on? Because you, you left the community in 2000, to, in, 2000. In, in 2000, yes. So was that already going on way back then? That actually started to occur uh, after I would left. Okay, that's what I thought, yeah. but I wasn't uh, sure. But the Fisher family was the first of the breakups, and that was one of the things that Strahd broke the camel's back. So I was on the very, very front of it. Mm. And so my dad's family was broke up, and within a couple months, I was kicked out. Wow. Because I retaliated because of that action. And so, uh, that wasn't okay. a popular thing to retaliate on a thing. So let me just give you a little story on kind of how that led up and the start of the breakup of the families, because I experienced that for the very, on the very front end of it. Right. And it got a lot more bizarre as it went on. but. Can I, um, sorry, real quick, can I sure. ask a question too about, before you, because I, I don't want to interrupt for your story sure. part, but um, a lot of people have asked, like, was, in your personal opinion, what was the main reason for them breaking up these families? Like, what was, what were the just to gain yeah. from it? Because a lot of people ask, 
you know, oh, was it because there's not enough women to go around because the leaders want it? Was it a disparity of men and women in the community? Yeah. Was it all for money? Like, what's your opinion of why they were even doing that to begin with? All the above. All the above. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All the above. So uh, there's, there's something I'm going to say, and it rings true. Um, and in any organization, a closed society like this, and in and, and many religions, not just FLDS, but you take off the mask of religion, and unfortunately, you're left staring at power and money. Yeah. And religion is simply a mask uh, and to, 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 go to get to those ends, a means to those ends. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's sad when it comes to the cost in, of families and individuals and, and personal lives. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really what got me involved, and I'll, I'll get into a little more of my story, what motivated me to do what I did um, uh, in trying to get grassroots efforts to, to right those wrongs. Right. But my experience uh, growing up, uh, leading up to this, the start or, or the, the time where it kind of came to where uh, I became at odds with the leadership and where they eventually uh, dispelled me from the community. So uh, I had, I was kind of very outgoing, a lot more probably outgoing than a lot of the, my siblings. Mm -hmm. I love people, I love the outside world, I loved uh, change, I loved challenge. Um, and so I was kind of uh, naturally took the position of this, the VP of sales marketing in our, in our family business, Forestwood Cabinetry. Forestwood, yep, Forestwood, yeah. Uh, and I ran the showroom in St. George. Oh, did you? And so I kind of helped build that bridge between FLDS and mainstream America for income and, and, and subsidies. And, and, and we had to you know, sell our goods and our services to someone besides just FLDS. <laughs> So there and was so, a there was a, a, a storefront in St. George. Yeah. So okay. Forestwood had a storefront, and I ran that for about 15 years. Wow. Uh, and so then you I were was, out of the community quite a bit. So I traveled every day from here to St. George, mm -hmm. and that's where I worked. Wow. Okay. Uh, and we had big displays down there, and that's where I did a lot of my interior design. That's where I'd meet a lot of our clients uh, to put together their their design their kitchens, design their the interior of their homes. Uh, and put together all the, the, the design, you know, for the work we did uh, here at the cabinet shop. Mm. Uh, and so I had an opportunity uh, by branching out in that way to really uh, seeing a lot of other uh, differences and other ways of life and education and information. Mm -hmm. um, and it gave me an education, a, a inside view of other than just this community and what they, they spoon fed you in this community. Probably helped you a lot and when that you really, to move. It really helped me gain a perspective of, of what was really going on. Right, good. Where a lot good. of people uh, wouldn't have had that opportunity. When no. you're born in a society like this, raised up and that's all they tell you from the ground up, you know nothing else. It's, True. you know, that's a lot of power. That's why it's so hard for so many of yes. us to move out. They Absolutely have no is. idea what they're getting into. Yeah, yeah. and I remember when I graduated out of high school, I was ready to go to college. Let's oh, go to college, I really? love it, you know. Wow. Uh, and I remember going into Leroy S. Johnson with my dad and you know, saying, and I'm saying, I want to go to college, and and Leroy S. Johnson saying, well, you need to you need to build up your dad's kingdom, uh, help him in his business. Uh, so instead of going to college, I want you to focus your time on your dad's business. Yeah. So, which I did. And back in your day, uh, going to college was it uh, was an actual possibility. It was a possibility at that time. They were they were allowing folks to. Uh, attend continued education for general ed. Mm -hmm. um, my older brother, Dr. Fisher, obviously he was told to go become a dentist, so he could become a dentist for the, the community, right? Yep. Did you uh, get to go to a regular public high school, or what did that, and so what my, was that a homeschooled high school? Yeah, or? so I went through uh, District 14 Mojave Public School, grades one through eight. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I went to a private college, the academy they called it, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for my freshman and, and sophomore year. Okay. And then they shut the private academy down due to the split and the confrontation that was going on at that time. And I was the first uh, uh, public high school student to get, do my junior and senior year back at Mojave 14. They created a high school there. Okay. And Mojave's here in the community. That's in Colorado okay. City. Yep. So and the Mojave College now it's called, right? That's different. That's Mojave Community College. Oh, okay. But oh, the public school at the time was District 14 Mojave. Okay. Uh, and I believe that's what it's still referred to. And they brought they that it. back. Yeah. Now. Okay. And now it's uh, they put a name on it, El Capitan High, for the El Capitan okay. High. Uh, and then they have the Water Canyon uh, Middle School now. 
Now they're building a water canyon, Washington County Public High School down yeah. here. Oh, wow. So it's evolving. Now that, now that Warren's not here over, yeah. overseeing everything, right. they're actually building schools. The education's and, back. When, a reminder for everyone, most everyone that lives here in this community now don't follow Warren Jeffs. Correct. Uh, most it's, of them were required to move out. Yeah, so. and when it was under Warren Jeffs' rule back 2000, Six through to 2015, they were told to pull all their kids out of public school, mm -hmm. all homeschool, all public institutions were abandoned from uh, continued education, and that was in an effort to have more control and, and, and I guess, uh, grasp on their community and yeah. what they, they learned. Most people here were just homeschooled. Yes. After, uh, you know, after when I was born and up until I left, everything, everything was more just homeschool. Yeah. College wasn't even in the question. Yeah. So and back in the day, it was nice that you know at least at least some, you had the chance to go ask yes. before you were told no. Yes. some people, <laughs> yeah, some people were able to do yep. it. And it. Sounds like you didn't though. Yeah. So and so what I did is I did help my dad. I did help build up the business, but when I went opened up my showroom in St. George, so I could further expand the business and fi find a bigger audience uh, and take a bigger market share because we were a growing company. Um, I snuck education down at Dixie College at night. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, good for wow. you. So I'd sneak down there after work and <laughs> take classes. Rebels. You guys, you little rebels. <laughs> Us rebels, right? Yeah, I'm going to learn math, darn it. <laughs> I'm going to take calculus, darn it. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, we took it there, took a lot of my discipline classes there, my uh, undergrad stuff there, and then uh, later with the community college in Salt Lake City. So. Good. Uh, Good. Well, some of you. Knowledge is power, you know, and yeah. so that's probably one of the reasons they didn't want people out here to get such a good education because absolutely. they didn't want them to rise up against what they were doing or something. That so. is absolutely true. Um, and so, you know, as, as I started seeing things from the outside of the community and seeing what was talked over the pulpit, I saw a, a stark difference of what was being told and what was reality. Mm. And so it kind of emboldened me to kind of start speaking, speaking out. Yeah. And so I did, I would speak out and, uh, and I created a lot of income and quality of life for a lot of people here that the Jeffs didn't really care for. Mm. And the Fisher family by and large had a big impact or a role in this community as far as employment. Right. And we opened up a log shop and our maintenance shop and our alcohol shop. And we had all these businesses going that the Irwin Fisher family was putting together. And, you know, we, we, it came to the point where I think we became a little bit of a, a threat uh, in power and size and in unity as one working block mm -hmm. uh, against the Jess family and uh, what they were trying to do right. and that what they were trying to change. And I think that was one of the things that really led to them breaking up my dad's family. Okay. Um, and it was kind of a divide and conquer type mentality. Shh. And I can remember uh, being called up, Warren uh, Jess was kind of running things, but his dad was on oxygen, rolling, mm -hmm. and was just kind of like a, a, a stuffed guy in a chair. Right, he didn't um, do much. He didn't do much. Right. And uh, I can remember getting a call at four in the morning uh, from the Jeff's home, saying, You're, you need to report up to the Jeff's home in the front room right now, with oh, your, you and your family. Wow. And, uh, and I'm thinking, that, so what is this all about? Four you in know? the morning. Yeah, four in the morning. Sheesh. So I go up there and here's, here's my 36 siblings all sleepy, tired, eyed, dragging their kids, you know, into that front room. And uh, Roland Jeffs is wheeled out in his chair on oxygen, you know, parked there in the front. And then he, uh, Warren Jeffs comes in and sits down and says, you know, uh, I, I need to inform all of you here that uh, your your father, uh, Erwin Fisher, is is no longer your your priesthood father, and and and, and you are all to, uh, you know, report uh, to to the Jess family, and and he's been sent out to repent, and and uh, you know he you need to all uh, align. You'll be assigned to new fathers, and uh, he even went so far as to ask us when we do are assigned to our new fathers, and that the mothers are assigned to the new priesthood appropriate uh, patriarchs that uh, we were able to change our surnames. No. Yeah, we were instructed to change our surnames from Fisher, if you can believe wow. that. Wow. Oh and within five days, uh, as, as just to move fast forward, my mom, Mary, was married to, to uh, Roland Jeffs. Oh, wow. Yeah. The guy on oxygen. Yeah, the guy on oxygen. Was yeah. There? Well, okay. he, within he, five days. Yeah, within five days. Uh, oh Rachel, the first mom, uh, was uh, reassigned to Dan Jessup. Yeah, Dan Jessup. Uh, Robin was assigned to Alan Steed. 
wow. And, and yeah. I can remember the family just in shock. I mean, their family just got split because three ways. Because at that ways. point, all of the yeah. all the children are going with the different yep. moms, yep. being split up, Everyone's three different separated. directions. And, how old and we you grew up with a very tight family. Yeah. You know, we were we were tight. We worked tight together. And uh, you know, I would have been um, at that point thirty years old. Wow. You know, and uh, I've been married for eight years with my arranged marriage and four kids, and and they. Rule and Jeff says, "No, I want you each to come up and you know personally shake my hand before you leave and and bear your testimony before you leave. You know of, of your truthfulness and your and I can remember a little sister, Lillian, just sobbing. You know because everything her world's falling apart. It she would have been exploded. Maybe yeah. six years old, six oh. years old. I mean, her family just busted Mama apart heart. right there at that early morning hour, yeah. unannounced. And she like, well, you know, sobbing. I can remember her saying." Well, if if dad, if father repents and 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 becomes a, a good priesthood man, and can 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 we still have him as our father? And Warren Jeff, just with no emotion, says, "Nope, the time is too late." Oh my goodness! Nope, the time is too late. So logistically, when someone's being separated like that, did you just not see your father again, or did was he like escorted from the home? Yeah. Where did he move? Yeah. Was so we were all instructed not to have audience with him. Mm not to seek him out uh to to kind of shun him right because he was this yeah he evil, was now evil man he, now they, they painted him to be an evil man which, which of course he probably didn't know what he and did he didn't and this is a man that had just spent his entire life building industry for this community creating jobs creating income for this community he had dedicated his entire life to it wow and to be treated like that you know at 70 whatever years old is unrealistic uh, That's so sad. And so I remember a lot of my siblings going up there and doing their thing. You know, sneeze, sneeze. we we <laughs> we uh, we had, you know accept the you know the directive and and I stood up and walked right out with my family. Good. Oh, good for you. Someone had to stand. Yes. I stood up and walked out and I knew. Well, this is a decision I'm going to make. And once the blood's in the water, you can't take it back out. <laughs> so so at that point, you said, okay, I don't want anything to do with this. Yeah. So you were 30. Yeah, I was 30 at that point. And you had how, how, just four one kid, wife? One wife and four kids. Okay, and the wife was assigned to you. Yeah. So at that point, what did, what did it look like? So you, did you just get up and take your stuff and leave the community? or? Nope. I, so I just left that meeting, came back here. I was living here um, and tried to conduct my life as I was already conducting it. Okay, just ignore what just happened. Ignore <laughs> what just happened. And, uh, and But then I started getting no-knock business and pressure, peer pressure. Oh, yeah from my other siblings and from uh, my, my mom, Mary, who is now married to the prophet. And I was instructed to, to, to actually move into Warren, or Roland Jeff's home. With your family? With my, with my mom and her siblings and change my last name and actually become a Jeff's and fall under that umbrella. Even though As a man with your own I, family? Yeah, you yeah. have your own wife and I And I like, kids. no, oh not gosh. gonna happen. And uh, wow. then, then I'll, the red flags all start going up, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Shem's not one of us. Shem's, you know, an apostate. Shem's, you know, this, that, and the other, which I was perfectly fine with. Sh at that, that point, point. Yeah. At that point, yeah. Um, and, and then uh, things start getting chaotic. Uh, a lot of pressure on me and, uh, and to, to conform. And I was called into a meeting with Warren Jeffs and Sam Barlow. And this was a mandatory meeting, just supposed to be the three of us. And, uh, and I knew exactly what it was about, oh, yeah. is to question Shem's faith and his you know, loyalty to the FLDS. Mm -hmm. uh, and they really wanted me bad because I was kind of one of the kingpins that were helping in the industry and business and, right. and all that in the community. So let's just say they probably went to a little extra lengths to try and reach out to me than the normal guy. Yeah, right. they don't want to lose yeah. you, yeah. but they yeah. don't want to lose control over right. you that at is the same correct. time. Yep. And so, they called the meeting over um, in Sam Barlow's office at that time. It was called Jawbone Consulting or something like that. And uh, so I remember going over there. It's a little office. Uh, go in a little round table. Um, I go, I, I'm supposed to be there at 9 in the morning, I believe. I'm running busy, so I get there at 9.15. Sam Barlow's already there. Warren Jess is already there. Oh, wow. And I have not even making Warren Jess wait for 15 minutes already. <laughs> Yeah, you're in trouble. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, you can't wait. You can't make yeah. him wait. <laughs> and, and, but at that point, I'm like, you're nothing special. You're, you're a wooden nickel to me already. You zip up your pants the same way as I do. Yep. Uh, you know, if you want a meeting, an audience with me, here I am. 
Yeah. Wow. You know, uh, I'm busy too. Yeah. And so, you know, I go in and sit down and, and Sam Barlow reprimands me for being late. You know, this is the servant of God here. And, you know, you're, you were asked to be here at a certain time and you're a little late. And so, you know, Brother Fisher, let's get started. And I look on his notes and the, right on the head of his notes, it says to question Sham Fisher's faith. Oh the question Shem Fisher's faith. That's right the, the purpose of, of the meeting. Purpose That's of the, the purpose meeting. of the meeting. Oh my goodness. Uh, and so uh, Sam Bartle starts off the meeting and says, you know, uh, uh, Brother Fisher, you know, uh, you're referred to Warren here as, as uh, uh, Prophet Warren and, and uh, be very respectful. And, and I'm like, no, I know Warren. Um, yeah, yeah, my, you know, I can, I, I'll just, do fine here. He just destroyed yeah. my family. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know this guy. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and you know, we'll have conversation. And uh, so, Warren Jass, you know, you know, starts asking questions. So, you know, are you faithful? Do you believe in FLDS? And I'm like, no. He says, not, not as it is, it's changed. Mm. I says, uh, this, this religion is, has changed dramatically uh, through, through the last uh, 10, 15 years. And uh, no, I don't. Wow. <laughs> and he started getting frustrated. He started, uh, so I started firing some questions back to him. And he tried to find scripture to justify it. And I'm like, let's just, let's just talk logical for a minute. And I pushed his, all his religious books aside, and I just sat across the table and said, let's just talk logical for a minute. And it, he, Warren Jeff just started freezing up. Oh, wow. Without his, without his doctrine and his, his biblical and all his stuff, uh, and be able to operate on that side and just talking st strict logic, and, and, and he just started freezing up. Wow. And he started getting frustrated uh, and I agitated. Can I can imagine. <laughs> and, uh, and I started just really laying in the questions hard on him. A lot, a lot of questions is, you know, what justifies you breaking up in families? Uh, you know, uh, do you know that the, the, the psychological damage that that causes? Mm -hmm. And I just started lighting into him. And, yeah. and Sam Barlow came around and said, Brother Fisher, you put arm around him. Brother Fisher, you need to calm down. You know, you, 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 you know, you're talking to a servant of God. You know, you need to have a contrite spirit and a humble, you know, we're trying to bring you back into the religion. You know, we're doing this on for your favor, for your good, da da da, oh, your family. Sweet. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> yeah. I said, no, no, I, th that isn't what this is about. No. I said, this is self-serving and it's for a different purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll be no part of it. Wow. Uh, Warren Jeffs got so upset. <laughs> he literally took a stack of books I shoved that away from me for the third time. <laughs> religious book. He took them and he, he stood up and he slammed them down on the table. Slammed them down. And he turned around and, and he started walking out and he turned around and said to Sam Barlow, I will no longer ever have audience with, with Mr. Fisher there. And wow. he is no longer welcome on UEP ground. Uh, he is not welcomed uh, in, in any of our, our meetings, wow. uh, and, and I am finished. And, and, and as he leave, before he reaches the door, I said, hey, Warren. And he's just startled because no one called him just Warren. He's yeah. to Brother oh, Jess or brother, Uncle Warren. Or, yeah, or, or, hey, Warren, he, he kind of turns around like, keep sweet no matter what. That's what, <laughs> you, That's what you said? <laughs> so I fed a little bit of yes, his dad's advice yes, right yes, back yes, into his yes. face. Stuck it and, through, huh? and he slammed that door so hard, I thought it was going to re revolve oh. off its hinges. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Wow. yeah I, I don't, I, everyone almost worshipped him, so to get treated like that, yeah. I can imagine how yeah. upset. And so I knew, and okay, it's going down. Stuff, you know, it's just about to hit the might fan. As well, you might as well yeah. go out with uh, yeah. the thing. I'm, right? I'm going to go down yeah. fighting. Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, yeah. general meeting uh, was it was right around uh, the the, the next. Uh, I believe it's next day. General meeting. Oh, oh uh, in Sam Barlow's office. I took, and Sam Barlow's sitting there taking notes, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> trying to follow it all, you know, the chatting match back and forth. Yeah. Oh. And, uh, and, and I reach across the table, grab his original notes, walk over on his copy machine and make a copy. I give Sam Barlow the, the copy and I take the original of the notes. <laughs> <laughs> and he just Mr. sitting copy. there like, what the like hell? Startled <laughs> they never expect this type of thing to happen. Yeah. So I'm yeah. sure they were just startled at that but, point. Warren Jeffs, I never believed Warren Jeffs or even his dad. Mm -hmm. um, he just felt like a wooden nickel to me all the time. He just, I never had that respect level, so I never feared him. Okay, yeah, uh, everyone, else, a lot of people did. So. Yeah, they aside, people, aside from those that left when he yeah. became How long was he in power by this time? Like, how long had you not believed in him or his father? What kind of I never believed in him and his father. Okay, so how I did believe in, in Leroy S. Johnson as a child okay. growing up. But when uh, Roland Jeffs came in power and I saw that was first changes, I'm like, no. Nope. Okay. So you know, you this would have been, I would have been like uh, 15, 16 years old. I'm like, nope, 
Okay, wow. so you Not had me. quite a long time of knowing like this isn't this, right, this yep. isn't right, and then that was just yep. the final straw. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people left the church at the point that the, the Jeffs took over. Yeah, at the point my family broke up, that's when I had nothing to lose. Yeah. Right. You know, that's why I was here as family. 36, uh, and I, 36 siblings that you grew up and cared about, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and once I lost that, it's like, what else do I got to lose? Yeah. yeah. You know, I can create a living. I can go anywhere and be employed. And you already had the experience yeah. of working outside yeah. of the community and all that. So, uh, but it was just uh, it was a, a life of convenience. I still wanted a relationship with my my family. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And quite honestly, I was good at what I did. Yeah. And quite honestly, I made a lot of money on what I yeah. did. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So leaving that meeting, what was your mindset like? I know you my said, mindset you said is, my mindset is okay. It's just a matter of time, and I'm I'm going to be forced out on every forced angle. Out, okay. Right. And uh, and so. Uh, they started, my family started uh, trying to get me out of the company, excommunicate, I was, I was, they were all instructed to, to get rid of me. Wait, so but wasn't the com was the company not your father's anymore at this uh, point? It, 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 it was my father's, but all the stocks were signed over to <gasps> no. the Jeffs. Yes. I'm like, wait a minute, how can they kick you out of your yeah. own family's company? Yeah. All the stocks were signed over. It's like taking a title and signing off the title and handing it to somebody. And they probably forced that just before they kicked it, him out of the community. Yeah. Yep, they okay. did. So they held all the all the stocks of the company. Wow. Oh my gosh. So they did have the power yeah. to be able to kick yep. you out of that. Yeah. And then I know you had mentioned the UEP property where you said, I want to drop the UEP. Mm -hmm. For those people who are listening that don't know, what is the UEP? UEP it stands for United Effort Plan. Yeah. Okay. And United Effort Plan was the community trust that the religion owned in a religion sense uh, under the disguise of religion to avoid taxes and a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the, the instrument in which they had uh, financial and physical control over everybody. Right. And they owned all the land, correct? They did. So they would give a piece of land yep. to someone? And well, they would, wouldn't give them to them. Oh. They would allow somebody to, uh, to, to occupy a piece of land, mm -hmm. and everything they did to that piece of land was a consecration to the church. So everything that you built, all, and for this Including specific this property, yes. everything you and everyone else that built something on a property, it was a consecration to it the was all owned property by the church, church yes. and it was just your way of basically helping uh -huh. out the church. Yes. In turn, you get somewhere to stay as right. long as you build it. Right. And did exactly <laughs> what you were told. And yeah. that, I was going to say, and then they can hold that over your head. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, and that, that's what so happened. So that's the how they were able to kick people yeah. out of the community so easily because they owned the literal house they were Correct. living in. And then it went one step forward, uh, further. In our priesthood meetings and stuff, they started teaching us under the Jeff's regime uh, that you know you also don't own your wife and kids. They are the, your they wife were, and kids belong to the priesthood because they were signed. So you were a tenant at will on the property. You are also uh, you are also a tenant at will in your marriage and your, to your wife and your kids. And the priesthood owns all of that, and they can change that at any moment time. That is just, and that's so sad, but it kind of helps people understand how the they were able to take it away from them yeah. as yeah. easy as they got it to begin with. Yeah, people, and we had a lot of people ask that. They're like, how can they, what do you mean they can separate yeah. husbands? Yeah. You know, how can they do that? Yeah, and for our listeners, uh, just to kind of bring a little more depth and foundation to why this has transpired, is when you're born into a society like this, and you're really taught that on a day-to-day -day basis through your whole upbringing, mm -hmm. um, you, you believe it. That's what you know and that's what you believe. 100%. Uh, and that's a lot of power. Uh, you don't need to hold a gun to somebody's head uh, when you've got that kind of mind power over them. You, they, will, they will do exactly you know, what they, you've been taught and told all your life. And unless something has intervened or there's an intervention at some point in that life of education or knowledge from some out external source mm -hmm. that allows people to kind of break from, free from that vortex. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it's powerful. It's so powerful, and if that's like like you said, Shim, if if that's all you know, that's what yeah. you're raised with, yeah. and the way they ran things out here, it was all about power and how they had all control and yes. and made us believe that everything that they said was from God, and if we didn't do exactly what we were told, we would be smitten, smote, yep, by God, smitten down, <laughs> and uh, we, we would uh, we would be cast and become a, a, a tool of the devil and and be cast out exactly and go to hell for sure and. Unfortunately, a lot of people believe that sincerely, and so when they were cast out, they were self-fulfilling prophecy. They did. Yeah. They did to go to the bottom. They self-medicated. They horrible and, about it. And they did. And they just did living out, you know, exactly what, what they thought was supposed to happen. Yeah. That was their destiny. Yeah, yeah. and for, um, 
and for the women too, like you were talking about the fact that you did have that outside education, you were able to see the real world. For women, it's even harder to leave or try to leave with their families or their children at all because again, they're told that their kids, that they are not only property of the church, but their children are property of the church. And isn't it a real thing that they know like if they tried to leave, the church would try to fight to keep their kids. That is correct, Melissa. And at that point, the church has some deep pockets uh, and a lot of legal uh, representation, good legal representation. Uh, and they hadn't lost a case in 40 years. Wow. Oh my goodness, uh, for trying to keep children Yeah, away for from children and, and all that. And so they were, they were very aggressive in defending themselves uh, to maintain the upper hand from a legal standpoint. And they were always revising their trust and their laws and bylaws to close any loopholes they could as they were going forward. Interesting. Uh, and so I was aware of that. I, I knew it would be a, a, t- a, a steep hill to climb mm-hmm. uh, and a tough one to, to do, but there's a saying that I'm going to throw out here, and it's very important, and that is, and it's something I learned from my older, older brother, Dr. Fisher, and you got to learn that when, if good people do nothing, no good is done. Yep. And there's another like part that. of that that's very important. You ought to have to have the courage. If good people don't have the courage to do something, no good is done. Yep. Like and it that. takes a combination of those things. And quite honestly, Melissa and Sam, I was operating to our original teachings. I just followed the original teachings of Leroy S. Johnson and, and our family and our core values and, and that's what gave me the courage and, and the, the power and the will uh, to right the wrongs. Good. To go yeah. after it yeah. uh, and to fight against the change. Yeah. So back to the story, you then, uh, when you decided, okay, everyone's going to come at me to try to get me out of this community, did you just take your family and leave? And so at that point, I bought a place in Salt Lake and I, I got my family, my, my wife and four kids immediately out because mm-hmm. they were getting pressure and a lot of no-knock visits from both sides of people to, for her to leave me and with the kids. So I got her out of the picture and nobody, nobody knew where they were. Oh, good. Oh, and good. I, out of defiance, just kept living here. And I was told to leave here, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't leave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and to make a point. To make a point. Yeah. And I, fi- I filed unjust enrichment and I clouded out of the title to the place, the LDS, or the FLDS title immediately. So they had to, they went into immediate legal actions, mm. but it bought me three or four months. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I, I came out swinging, fought them off. They had to go through due process. Uh, it took them about three months before they could serve me papers from Washington County Sheriff, evicting me from my home. Wow. <laughs> and how did your wife and kids, what was that transition like for them? Were, did they still believe and was it a hard thing to think, okay, we're leaving this? Yeah. Did they feel like they were going to go to hell or that yeah. it, they were in that situation? Or were they kind it of more on the same page with you of like, no, this, well, there isn't truth to it? I guess the salesman and me talked him into coming out with me, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and I was able to talk him you know, out to, to moving and, and getting away from it, as, but it was tough. Because mm-hmm. uh, they didn't know anybody in Salt Lake or anything else, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so it was a rough transition for them, and not having any knowledge or the same exposure or idea of how mainstream America worked, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it was it was they were going yeah, into yeah. a great unknown. Yeah. Uh, but they did make that transition initially out into the uh, the mainstream world. Um, my arranged marriage at that point. Um, the pendulum swung hard the other way. Mm. Uh, she started dabbling into things that weren't healthy for herself or in the kids. Mm. Um, and uh, I had to, within a few months, file for full physical legal custody of my own four oh, kids. Wow. Oh, wow. Uh, there was a legal divorce that ensued. Um, and we did separate. Um, and I got full physical custody of my four kids. Wow, okay. I mean, sad for her, but yeah. then you got, you yeah. got to keep the kids. I did. And uh, so I was a single parent for a while on the outside of to four kids. To go from a community like yep. this to being a single it was a father big transition would be a with the baby wow. being thir- 18 months old. Wow. Oh <clears throat> so <clears throat> that was an adjustment for me. Oh yeah. yeah. An adjustment for my family. But um, I felt like that's what I needed to do for the, the, the future, the, a good future for my kids. Right. Because uh, I could see no future in the way this was going here no. for them. Yeah. Well, and we see how it turned out. Yeah. So. <laughs> your, predi- so, your prediction was right. Yeah. And so I, the, I took one last shot at Warren in general meeting. And in general meeting was, you have about a congregation of 6,000 yep. to attend general meeting here. And so uh, I dress up the, my three oldest kids 
Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, all on their best Sunday, and you go to general, you go to meeting, and that morning was priesthood meeting, uh -huh. and they were supposed to kick me out of the line in priesthood meeting that morning. Oh wow! You know, with all the Barlows and the God Squad all lined up, you're supposed to, you know, kind of go through the gauntlet there, going to the priesthood meeting, uh -huh. and they were supposed to screen me out and escort me out at that point. Wow. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> I was sly in how I did. I surrounded myself with a bunch of my close buddies and friends mm -hmm. and made a big thing as I just went through the big pack and kind of just bypassed the God Squad. <laughs> and I got into the meeting and they weren't able to accomplish kicking me out at that at the door type of thing. Okay. So they didn't even want to allow you in to be <laughs> right. in. Right. Okay. Yeah. But I, I evaded them, got past, got into the Ted Priest meeting. And, uh, and I could just see eyes on me, all the, you know, born the priesthood meeting. <laughs> yeah. And uh, especially the GS family, they just, oh yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so general meeting, I took, took my shot. So I went, dressed all the kids up, my three went into general meeting, sat down, um, and you know how the meeting, general meeting ends, Warren Jeff's the last speaker. Mm -hmm. And Warren Jeff's always sets the tone on the last, the, the last closing remarks. And he stands up to do his closing remarks, and I stood up right in the congregation. <laughs> and I says, Warren Jeffs, before he could even say anything, he just froze and oh, grips yeah. the side of his pulpit like oh, this, yeah. like, uh, and, uh, and I says, and I pointed my finger right at him, I says, any time a religion breaks up a family, it's wrong, it's bizarre, and it's got to stop. Yep. He just he just freezing there for a while. Didn't know what to do. He's never been challenged right in front of his constituents, of his him. audience, yeah. and everything. And I just called him out on it. Good. Wow. And uh, and and then he he motions, he kind of motions to the God Squad, and the and I was surrounded from three different sides, and and stood up escorting out of the the meeting house, and you could hear a pin drop. Oh. And my kids are all following me out, and we get to the main entrance on the south, going out before we left the main hall. And my, my little seven-year-old Tasha turns around like, Father, why are these evil men not letting us stay to hear the word of God? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone can hear that oh, to the whole audience. That's a slap in the face. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, and they all grab her and tug her away. And we were oh. escorted out. And, oh my goodness. and I remember being thrust out those front doors. And it was like a burden off my shoulder. It was, the last, oh. it was, like, yeah, it was like a huge lift off my shoulders. I just yeah. felt free. It was a nice, sunshiny, July warm day, and it was like, right, freedom. I'm, I'm done. You know, I'm done. I'm this done. is it. And uh, I served papers by Washington County Sheriff uh, shortly after, and uh, I brought in some 18-wheelers uh, and loaded it up and, and headed, pointed my hood north for the first for the last time in what a while. Salt uh, Lake City. Salt yeah. Lake City. Until um, recently you were able to come back and, and get it yep. and turn it into a lot. But uh, I was able to get involved in a lot of grassroots effort from that point on. I was very instrumental in helping with uh, the Lost Boys push. Oh, were you? Yeah, uh, gathering up the Lost Boys and, and we call them, them Lost out. Boys and helping them out. Yeah. A lot um, of people have questions about them. I never, I, when I moved out, I was 18, so I never. You never needed I, assistance or that? I never, yeah, I never got involved in Lost Boy anything, but I heard about it and a lot yeah. of people have questions about that. So. Yeah. Um, but you were a part of that then. I actually helped coin that name. Oh, you did! <laughs> wow. Lost Boys, and it wasn't from the Lost Boys sedan. It was just we were uh, we were in a, a, some heavy duty legal uh, consulting with Joanne Suter out of Delaware, and it was at Little America, and it was trying to uh, decide, you know, what what case or what name should we put on this case? Because uh, we were trying to put to, uh, change Utah law uh, with John Huntsman at that point, the governor, to emancipate these kids so we could help them. Oh wow! Yeah. And never before there been a need to emancipate a child from their biological parents, so you could help them. Wow! And yeah. but this had COVID created a situation or an environment where the natural parents were no good to the kids because they were told by the church to abandon them. Yep. Um, and now the the state couldn't even reach in and help them because they still had biological yes. parents alive and, and able mm -hmm. yep. uh, to help their and, and, and our hands were tied. We're so, stuck in limbo. Yeah, and so, well, what do we call this case and how do we go after it and how do we put, you know, get uh, traction on it? So, call the Lost Boy case. There you go. And so, and then that Joanne Suter reached said, yeah, we'll call the Lost Boy case. Mm -hmm. And Joanne Suter, just to put a little bit of information, she's the one that went after the Catholic Church okay. and uh, broke the Catholic Church, uh, a lot of the pedophilia and brought that to light. Oh, and so we had to go outside of Utah and Arizona and Mormon relationship legal uh, counsel to real bring real change and traction to this. We had to go to Delaware. But we, we, we had to go where we could get help. So uh, but that brought in a lot of the, uh, the, the legal muscle we needed mm -hmm. uh, to bring in the change and the lobbyists and the uh, detectives 
uh, to bring the state's evidence and to bring everything needed to get that law passed and then also to start uh, bringing actions against uh, FLDS and, and against parents who were, they were, who were uh, I guess, wrong in what they were doing, but they right. were just following what they were doing. They didn't, uh, well, they didn't, they didn't really have a choice. Yeah, <laughs> so. or they'd be kicked out. Exactly. And so yeah. at one point I had over 400 of these lost boys under my direction. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> so when they would, so you were able to get them emancipated, yeah. what did the process look for them? Where most of these boys were kicked out, correct? Yes. Okay. It Some of as young as 12 years old. Okay. And they were just thrown out on the street? Yeah, like stray cats with the clothes wow. on their back. So what did that process look like? And I know you said that you've helped with an organization as well. We tell yeah. viewers a little bit about that. Yeah. There's a lot of people who ask, what's a way they can help? Yeah. What's a way we can get involved? Yeah. And we've kind of been looking for an organization yeah. as well to help kind out. of yeah. help out with. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a number of organizations and one that we uh, uh, started right with the inside of our company, uh, me and our older brother back at that time through Ultra Down Products was uh, Smiles for Diversity. And it was a nonprofit organization that we set up. Uh, and it doesn't just help uh, children in this case, in this religion, it helps third world countries and the quality of life in a lot of countries. So uh, we opened that up and, and, and put a copious amounts of dollars and made them available to, to help kids that were tossed out on the streets, um, bring them into uh, halfway homes, uh, to bring them therapy, uh, bring them psychology they needed that, to, to realize that they, they weren't garbage and they, weren't, they were human beings, they had value. And, uh, they Good. could still contribute to society, um, and we put a lot of effort into that. It was a, a concerted effort because there was just such a need in so many of these victims at that yeah. point. And later on, there was even a few girls, believe it or not, that well, near the end out. of that whole thing that were even kicked out. Wow. Uh, that we had to help through uh, that same process. Wow. Uh, but it got to be such a, a strain and drain on me and, and my life and what I was trying to do. That we actually had to bring in social workers, uh, you know, people that were actually trained to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people knew me from that era or kind of knew of me. So it was natural. I was kind of the go-between, the bridge, the, the first connection, the phone call, you know, that the could, you know, give a, a voice of, of, of familiarity and trust that to, to at least help them. Because they were told started. to shun all help, you know, yeah. shun all outside help. You know, everything's bad. That's what they're told. That's what we were, yep. and, uh, and so I had to kind of let them know, no, there's, there's real people out there. It's, it, there's good people out there. Um, there's life outside of FLDS, basically. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's a great life. That's uh, the main reason I left was because yeah. I, I noticed that there were good people outside yeah. of the community and that we, that's not what we were told. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so. And, uh, and I, I, I trusted that and, uh, and got a lot of kids to trust to, to come across to that. And then not only that, we, also used a lot of these kids and, and helped them uh, uh, bring evidence and, and first witness evidence, things that they experienced uh, in FLDS that were civil rights, straight blatant civil rights violations uh, that were being acted and exacted at the hands of uh, FLDS leadership mm. uh, upon families, be anything from incest to, to, uh, to break up of families to you know, uh, to, to basic need, uh, starving people of basic needs for control. Mm -hmm. um, some of those things are just basically civil rights violations. Right, uh, right. And that's what really fired me up to, to really put my heart and soul into it and my older brother, Dr. Fisher. Um, I had a lot of the information and the knowledge and uh, what transpired, how they ran their books, and how they falsified a lot of their things, how they did their racketeering. Um, uh, fortunately, Dr. Fisher had a lot of the resources at the time to put the legal counsel and muscle behind it and the detectives to kind of prove it out and bring it all together and put a nice bow on it and hand it to the prosecution so they could do something Good. with it. Good. Yeah. So we started some of the first organizations from Smiles for Diversity right inside of Ultra Dam Products. Smiles for Diversity. Yeah, Smiles for Diversity. Okay. okay, we'll post the link to the okay. website, I'm yep. sure. They do. Right? And it's, uh, it's still active. Uh, and it still uh, holds out uh, help for college continuing education uh, for students that are uh, victims of FLDS or find themselves in that position uh, to continue it on to education because we believe that uh, education is the number one thing, the best gift you can give to an individual that's in this position. I agree. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I experienced that myself yeah. and uh, was lucky, lucky enough to have help when I moved out from, an out from a family outside of this community mm -hmm. that in a way took me in and uh, kind of taught me the importance of education. So I ended up getting an education and that just changed my life. It does, yeah. it really does. Um, and so there's also a safety net out of uh, St. George. There's a Christian center here uh, that now occupies the Warren Jeffs old uh, property. Really? Uh, that is right here local, that uh, provides uh, free help and therapy. 
there's also a, uh, a legal uh, uh, office over here in Colorado City uh, that offers free legal services for uh, victims of FLDS that are trying to transition out. Um, anything from family law to, to uh, corporate law to you name it. Wow, uh, that can there's help a lot of help transition. out there. There is. Good. All these things have been put in place. The state has put in uh, uh, some detectives and oversight receiver or people that, that monitor the community uh, all the time. They have an office just literally right out here by Mojave Community College oh, wow. uh, that is staffed by the state of Arizona to uh, help people 24-7. Um, and so a lot of resources have been added for people that are interested. Uh, in, in changing or, or changing up what they are experiencing or, or address uh, uh, issues they're experiencing and want to move on with their life. So it's, uh, there's a lot of resources out there, a lot of good people out there dedicated to uh, helping uh, victims. And uh, all you got to do is reach out to any of those divisions and they can network you into whatever you need and the resources that are available. Absolutely. And like I said, we will link in the description um, some of these organizations. And if you are watching and you are still part of that community and need help getting out as well, we'll try to put some resources there because we've actually kind of heard through different grapevines that yeah. there are people that are still a some, part of it yeah. that have been starting to see some, some people of these have videos. Some have seen some of our videos. Yeah. So it's yeah, and what I would say to people that still do believe sincerely uh, in FLDS and their teachings, uh, and that wish to move on, I definitely don't want to change anybody if they're happy and it's working for them. Uh, but for those that are maybe questioning it and feel like uh, they're being abused in any way, shape, or form by FLDS, have the courage to reach out and ask for help. Help is out there. Yeah. Um, and my only regret uh, I, in, in my personal life is that I didn't do what I did sooner. Because Amen. you know what, I've had an awesome life and uh, the decisions I made not only made a fruitful, rich life for myself, but also for my children. Yep. Yep. What more can you ask for, right? Yep. So, uh, and then just to kind of end on things, uh, you you mentioned that you had a part in uh, yes. actually putting Warren Jeffs into prison. Yeah, so, so he opened up three lawsuits uh, uh, when I was uh, kicked out. And one was against uh, forced to it itself for, for uh, employment uh, discrepancies. Uh, and then uh, one was against the FLDS uh, okay. uh, Corporation. And then one was against Warren Jeffs directly. Okay. <laughs> and wow. uh, and the one with Warren Jeffs directly uh, allowed us to put some good legal muscle on the case and uh, some good PI work into it, and uh, eventually led to his arrest outside of Las Vegas in his Red Escalade. Um, and you know the three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars that he was got caught with uh, in that arrest. Didn't pay for all the legal fees to arrest him, but <laughs> it, it went a little, it'll, it, it kind of helped pay for some of that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, talking, so are you allowed to talk about like what were your suits against him for, or are those still um, present? I, past? Yeah, I, I can't talk about the details of those because there's there certain elements of those that are that are not completely closed out yet. Oh, okay. But a lot of it was uh, 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 civil rights violations to other individuals, underage marriages, um, and uh, racketeering. I can speak to that. Um, uh, uh, tax evasion, uh, some of yep. those things. So were that was that like the original ball rolling? Because I mean, someone had to be the first had person to start something. Let's, put it, to start let's something. put it this way. We never wanted to prosecute polygamy. That wasn't our intent, nor will it ever be my intent. Mm -hmm. um, all our legal actions that we take and all our future legal actions that we'll take uh, have to do with uh, criminal mischief and activity. Nothing to do with religion, and that's why he's in prison for yes. those for yep. those exact those reasons. Exact reasons. Yeah. And uh, and that's that's what fired us up, and that's what inspired us to do what we did. Good. So so it was your legal action that you took against him that that helped yes. get him put him into prison. Okay. Correct. And is that is that kind of were those lawsuits the main reason that the FBI and the the police force was after him? Yes, and for the fact that he was creating these illegal uh, criminal activities in multiple states got the federal government involved. Well, that's in what FBI. got the FBI involved, yeah. okay. Yeah, because I know they were yeah. on, he was on one of their- He was on the top, top 10 wanted top list. Top 10 wanted list yeah. for quite some, do you know how long that was? It was- uh, About two and a half years. About two and a half years yeah. he was on the run. Yeah. Wow. In his red Escalade or who knows how many vehicles. And, and he had several disguises in that Escalade, yeah. wigs and different disguises uh, to try and help him evade a lot of burner phones and a lot of information that uh, was very helpful in that Escalade too. No, oh, was there? No, good. Yeah. To help put him away? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For those things that um, that you filed the lawsuit against, did you 
at what point did you find those things out? Like in your journey, were you, did you kind of know about them already ahead of time? I already knew, I knew a lot about a lot of them from personal knowledge when I was here. Okay. Uh, Cause I had a lot of deep roots into a lot of different organizations uh, when I was in the community. So I had knowledge of them and where to look. Interesting. And okay. so I was, uh, had the opportunity to help direct the right sources and, and individuals, um, PIs to help uncover those, those items. Wow. Gotcha. I mean, half the battle is knowing where to look, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, there's so many people out here. Me, for example, when growing up, I didn't know that he was doing all these immoral, yeah. illegal things. I, I mean, I knew that under, underage marriage was happening, Yeah. but I didn't, uh, because I grew up here, I didn't realize that was a bad thing. Yeah. That's just all I knew. But all the other other stuff that came out later, I'd, I had no idea that yeah. was happening. And a lot of people didn't know. Right. And that, by design, they, they weren't. The Jess family didn't want that to get out. Exactly. There's still uh, people that don't even. Oh yeah. I mean, there's still people that the either still don't know or don't him. believe right. that. Right. Well, that couldn't be true. Yeah. I believe it was fabricated information or no, something like that. Not fabricated. No, I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know that now. It's but very factual. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. As we've seen family members of Sam's come out and leave, and seeing where they're at and their beliefs, they yeah. know most of the time now when they leave, it doesn't seem because it's in a lack of belief in yeah. Warren Jeffs. They still fully believe that it's you know he had a brother that left because he wanted to get married. Yeah. Just being able to have a family now yeah. isn't allowed. And so yeah. just those simple needs and wants as a basics, human yeah. being, yeah, yeah, basic things. It took, like him, it took him, I would say, probably a full year uh, after learning more about what Warren Jeffs was up to and all this information that he finally said, okay. And then, <laughs> it took him a while, wow. even after he left. Well, you have to realize, because that, that's, that's a big part for a psychology, your psychology gets wrapped around. Because you have to, at some point, admit that everything you believed was a lie. Yeah, that's yeah. tough. That's, that's tough. So tough. That is really tough. And that's really what really holds tough. a lot of people. Yeah. So yeah. they want to admit that. Yeah. They're sincerely wrong. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Well, we're grateful that people like you were able to <laughs> uncover what was going and, on and, and, and help get the ball rolling to get him put away because obviously. You know what's gratifying is when when I come back now all these years later, and I come back as as hopefully as a as a, as a light of light of uh, encouragement to the mm -hmm. community. An example, I have people approach me and, and say, I apologize that I, I prayed for your death. You know, we were told to pray for your death over the pulpit. You know, from the pulpit was told to pray for your death. Uh, when I opened up all these lawsuits, you know, uh, I was that bad apostate, I was that guy. Were you afraid of for your life at any point? So I was under 24 seven uh, witness protection for a number Where of years. Were you? And with my family and Dr. Fisher, I wore bullet proof vests, uh, my, my marriage that I'm in now uh, was at Ultradam Products and we had snipers on the roof. I had a bulletproof vest, I was packing heat. My wife was packing heat. Um, I had personal bodyguards. Wow. Uh, for it was several, a rough life. For several yeah. years yeah. after you moved out. Yeah. I had Homeland Security park right in my yard and stay there all night. Wow. <laughs> wow. See, these yeah, are the we stories were being watched. These we are the were things I didn't experience, yeah. you know? So it's so interesting. That I know that there's a lot more intense stories out there than what I personally experienced. I would yeah. say my, my experience out here was fairly mild compared to a lot of people. Yeah. I was very blessed, very lucky in a lot of ways. You got escorts to work and back. All my office went with that bulletproof glass. <laughs> wow. Wow. Did you, wow. <laughs> I don't know what to ask about that. That's, yeah, that's wow. just so... Did they... Um, was it the FL... Was it Warren Jeffs? specifically like trying to send people after you or was it so Willie Jessup and I, I don't have direct con confirmation but people like the Willie Jessups were considered the Rockwells okay body, there we go that's, what, that's what I'm asking like yeah. was it they people were, that were going to try to take they it were armed up hands. and they were they well, were instructed to, to take care of business we, we would see them walking with 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 weapons and, and and escorting Warren Jeffs places and things yeah. so I, I mean they were kind of his bodyguards yeah yeah so it I, I knew I mean I didn't know they would actually go out and actually try to harm someone in that way, but I guess they may have. Uh, Let's just say the state needed us healthy yeah. and alive to do what we needed to do, Jeez. to accomplish what needed to be accomplished. So they, they put a lot of resources into making sure that it, that happened. Good. Well, good for you, and thank you for all you did. You bet. And yes. thank you for uh, for being here. This has been very in informative for us and for our viewers, of course. So yeah. pleasure. It's been so fun, and thanks for letting us be here. You're beautiful. Oh my goodness, this lodge is this. beautiful. Yes. Watch our other video. I will put the description or the link above to our video touring his beautiful home that turned into a lodge. If you ever if you ever visiting Zion National Park, 
It's a great place to stay, not too far away from it. So yeah, it's super close to Zion. We'll be taking the back way, and it's what a half hour. Yeah, it's a it's a 16 mile from the back way. We call it the Zion South Entrance Less Traveled or Zion Less Traveled. <laughs> yeah. Zion Less Traveled. Yeah. yeah. So we'll be taking it's that that way tomorrow. Currently still a dirt road, but they're planning on hopefully someday paving, paving it is the yep. goal here. So. But if you have four wheel drive and want a, a nice scenic route to yep. get to yep. Zion, but it's a quick way. Yeah. Bye. So, but thank you all, and we'll talk to you soon. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. So <laughs>